Good evening, listeners. This is Bob Cummings speaking. Tonight, the Prior Lake players bring you Charles Dickens' well-loved tale of Yuletide, A Christmas Carol. This year's production is brought to you by the fine people at Hauk Machine Company. Hauk Machine Company is a manufacturing industry leader in the Twin Cities, producing complex metal and plastic components for high-tech industries. They are known for building strong relationships both inside and outside the company. They aren't just people and machines. They are a complex network of relationships with dedicated and experienced technicians that are committed to their craft. With over 36 years in the industry, their knowledge and experience are what set them apart. Hauk Machine Company. Experience the difference. Last year, the Prior Lake players went shopping for a Christmas present to give to all their friends. They found it in this story, Charles Dickens' embodiment of the very spirit of Christmas, but susified. And they chose well, because throughout the country today, in thousands of homes, it has become an important and beloved Christmas custom to listen to this story, this time in its original form. Tonight, this presentation is brought to you with the sincere wish that your Christmas may be a happy one and with the hope that the retelling of A Christmas Carol may help to make it so. Storytelling has persisted as a Christmas ritual in spite of the printing press, a ceremony as hilarious and as serious as hanging the stocking, dressing the tree, and kissing under the mistletoe. And because Christmas is, first of all, for children, Christmas stories are fairy tales, first of all. It is mildly surprising that the best of them all, which we're telling again for you tonight, is for everybody, and turns out to be a ghost story. I have endeavored, writes its author on its title page, I have endeavored in this ghostly little story to raise a ghost of an idea, which shall not put my readers out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me. May it haunt their houses pleasantly, and no one wish to lay it. It is signed, Your faithful friend and servant, Charles Dickens. Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatsoever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead, of course he did. Scrooge and Marley were partners I don't know how many years. Oh... But he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. Scroogey, squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Secret and self-contained. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the air, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was a cold, bleak, biting evening, foggy with all, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement to warm them. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, Bob Cratchit, who, in a cold and dismal little cell, Yawned, worked at his ledgers. Forty-nine, nine carry two, thirteen, seventeen, seven, carry one. Close the door, Cratchit. Shut out that infernal noise. Yes, Mister Scrooge. Confound impudence! Yeah, uh, Cratchit. Yes, Mister Scrooge. You're to stop at Fourth Guilds on your way home tonight and collect that seventeen shillings and sixpence he's owed me since Michaelmas. And tell him that I shall have the constable over there if he doesn't pay it at once. Well, sir, Mr. Fothergill's wife has been ill, sir. What do I care about his wife? I want my seventeen and six. I, I just... 
Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Bob. Oh, Mr. Fred, well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Hmm. Uh, humbug. Humbug? Christmas to humbug, Uncle. Now, I'm sure you don't mean that. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Well, come then, Uncle. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Uh, humbug. Oh, don't be cross, Uncle. Well, what else can I be when I live in such a world of fools? What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? Merry Christmas. Time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with a Merry Christmas on his lips would be... should be boiled in his own pudding. Hmm. Buried with a stake of his own holly through his heart. Uncle! Yes, you... Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. What do you want, nephew? A Christmas gift, I have no doubt. I came to wish you a, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. A Merry Christmas? <laughs> Much good may Christmas do you. Much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, Uncle. Christmas among the rest, but I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, and therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good, and I say God bless it. God bless Christmas! Hurrah! Let me hear another sound from you out there, Bob Cratchit. And you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. As to you, nephew, I wonder you don't go into Parliament. You talk enough nonsense. <laughs> don't be angry, Uncle. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry you feel that way. Well, I've tried. Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a happy new year, too. Humbug. Humbug. Merry Christmas to you, Bob and the missus. And to Tiny Tim. Thank you, Mr. Fred. Same to you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day, Bob. Merry Christmas, Uncle Ebenezer. Uh, nonsense flummery. Talking of Christmas and not a sixpence to jingle against another in his trousers pocket. You there, Bob Cratchit. Yes, you sir. You there. What are you doing in there? Oh, I was only putting a bit more coal on the fire, Mr. Scrooge. Seeing it's so cold near, sir. You put that coal back in the scuttle. Oh, yes, sir. A fire. A fire indeed. I can tell you if you use coal at that rate, you and I will soon be parting company, Bob Cratchit. You understand that? Many young fellows like your situation, you know. I'm sorry, sir. My fingers were getting a little stiff with the cold. <laughs> then put on your mittens. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! There's someone at the door. See who it is. Yes, sir. Merry Christmas, sir! Merry Christmas. Uh, <clears throat> yes, sir. This is the firm of Scrooge and Marley. Yes, sir. I should like to see the head of the firm, if I may. Oh, very good, sir. Step this way, please. What is it? A gentleman to see you, Mr. Scrooge. Eh? Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley has been dead these seven years tonight. Oh. Well... And I'm Scrooge. Though I doubt it'll be any pleasure to you, sir. Oh, I'm sure it will. Now, Mr. Scrooge, at this season of the year, it's only fitting that we who are more fortunate should raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. You may not believe it, sir, but many thousands are now in want of common necessities, and hundreds of thousands are in want of comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? 
There, there are plenty of prisons, sir. And the workhouses, they are still in operation, I trust. I wish I could say that they are not, but they are, sir. The treadmill and the poor law are still in full vigor, then? Both very busy, sir. Yeah, I'm very glad to hear that. I was afraid from what you had said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. Now, sir, what do you want with me? Well, Mr. Scrooge, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund for the poor and destitute. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous, sir. I wish to be let alone. I don't make merry at Christmas time, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments that take care of the poor. They cost enough. Let those who are badly off go there. Well, many can't go there, sir. Many would rather die. Then let them do so and decrease the surplus population. Besides, how do I know that's true? You might know it someday, Mr. Scrooge. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, sir. Cratchit, show this gentleman out. Cratchit! Yes, sir. This way, sir, please. Uh, excuse me, sir. I couldn't help but overhear it. I should like to contribute three pence. It's all I can afford. But if there are others in worse situation than I am... You are a generous fellow. I wish I might say the same for your employer. Good afternoon, sir. Merry Christmas! Good day! Good afternoon, sir, and a Merry Christmas! 15, 24, 31, 1 and carry 3, 17, 22, 23, 3, carry 3, 4, 7, 8. Catch it. 15. Catch oh, it. Yes, sir. Catch it. It's too late to have you stop at Father Gill's. You'll be closed up for Christmas like those other fools. We may as well close up this place now. Yes, sir. It is getting a little dark. Hard to see the figures. I suppose you'll want the entire day tomorrow, Cratchit. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I were to stop half a crown of your wages, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. Well, sir... And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. Yes, once a year. Once a year indeed. A fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Well, I suppose you must have the whole day. Well, see that you are here the earlier the next morning, do you understand? Oh, I... I will, sir! I will! Well, good night, sir. Good night, and... Me <clears throat> good night. Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. Ah. The office was closed in a twinkling, and Bob Cratchit, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no grey coat, went down a slide on Corn Hill twenty times in honour of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play with his family at Blind Man's Bluff. Scrooge, on the other hand, took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers, and spent the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to his dismal house. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, had to grope with his hands. The fog and frost hung about the black old gateway of the house. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. Before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. A small fire in the grate of his bedroom, spoon and basin ready, and a little saucepan gruel upon the harbor. Nobody under the bed, 
Nobody in the closet. Closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in. Then he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed. Nothing on such a bitter night. Not even to kindle a glow of light in the cheerless room. Scrooge stretched his numb fingers over the wretched fire. Then he saw something that made, that made him draw them back. Slowly, the meager embers dissolved before his astonished eyes, dissolved into a face, a ghostly face, but one that Scrooge recognized as the face of Marley. Marley! his partner dead these seven years. It was not an angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hairs were curiously stirred like flames blown from a chimney draft, and through the death-cold eyes, Scrooge saw the buttons on the back of his coat. <laughs> Humbug. 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 Scrooge got up and walked away from the fire. As he turned, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the corner of the room. It was with great astonishment and with strange inexplicable dread that he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing slowly. It was the same face, the same face he had seen in the fire, Marley's face, and Marley, Marley's body coming straight at him through the door, a body pale as the bluish smoke that comes from a chimney on a cold day, a body so transparent that Scrooge Looking through his waistcoat, could see his watch in his waistcoat pocket. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, and heavy purses wrought in steel. Even now, Scrooge would not believe his eyes. The ghost advanced towards him. Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge! Marley, what do you want with me? Much. Who, who, who are you? Ask me who I was. Uh, who were you then? You're, you're particular for a ghost. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley? But you're dead. You died seven years ago this very night. You do not believe in me, then? I, uh, I do not. Why do you doubt your senses? Well, because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You, uh, you may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There may be more gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. <laughs> humbug, I tell you. Humbug. At this, the spirit, taking the bandage off from around his head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped upon its breast. <laughs> Men of worldly mind! Do you believe in me now? I, I, I do, Jacob. I, 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 I do. <laughs> Why do you walk the earth? Why do you come to me, Jacob? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide to witness what it cannot share but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. D tell me, Jacob, what is that chain you wear around you? I wear the 
chain I have forged in life. Cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, purses. I made it link by link by my own free will. Is its pattern strange to you, Ebenezer? Yours was as heavy and long as this seven years ago, and you've labored on it since, Ebenezer Scrooge. Jacob, <laughs> old Jacob Marley, tell me more, but speak comfort to me, Jacob. Yeah, I have none to give, Ebenezer. No rest, no peace. Incessant torture of remorse. You were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business! Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, benevolence, they were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Jacob! Hear me, Ebenezer Scrooge. My time is nearly gone. I, I, I will. I will, Jacob, but... Don't be hard on me. Speak to me, Jacob, but please don't be flowery. I'm here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance in hope of escaping my fate, Ebenezer. You you were always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you. And go on. Go on, Jacob. Listen to me, Ebenezer. You will be haunted by three spirits. I... Uh... I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, Ebenezer Scrooge, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night. Look to see me no more. And look that, for your own sake, you remember what is passed between us. Marley... Dick and Valley. Scrooge awoke. He was lying on his bed, fully dressed, when suddenly the curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. As close to it as I am now to you, and I am standing in the spirit of your elbow. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it. And the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its dress was of the purest white, trimmed with summer flowers. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprang a clear jet of light by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using. In its duller moments, a great extinguisher or a cap which it now held under its arm. Ebenezer Scrooge? Ebenezer Scrooge? Are uh, you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. <laughs> Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. <laughs> Long past? No, your past. <laughs> Business brings you here. What do you want of me? Your welfare. Ebenezer Scrooge, rise and walk with me. Huh? No, no, not the window. I'm mortal. I'll fall down. Bear but a touch of my hand there upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Come, follow me. Let us go. <laughs> They stood upon an open country road with its fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold winter day with snow upon the ground. They walked along the road, 
Scrooge began to recognize every gate, every post, every tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge, its church, and winding river. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs or in sleighs. And all these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other that they were happy, shouting through the broad fields until they were in so full of music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. And there stood old Scrooge in his dressing gown and slippers and nightcap on the hill. And beside him, the spirit of Christmas passed. And now, the spirit spoke again. Not all the boys and girls were singing on that Christmas day, were they, Ebenezer Scrooge? See the bleak building over there? <laughs> that building? I was a boy there. I went to school in that place. Do you recollect the way? I... I could walk it blindfold. Strange, you have forgotten it for so many years. Come, let us go closer. Look through the window into this cold, barren room. What do you see, Ebenezer Scrooge? I, I see a boy. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, sitting alone, a book open before him. <laughs> yes. Yes, I see. I know that boy. I was lonely. I... Your lip is trembling, Scrooge. Oh and what's that on your cheek? <laughs> hey, it's, it's nothing. Nothing. I... I wish I... Uh, but it's too late now. What is the matter? Nothing. Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I... I should like to have given him something. That's all. That is all? Come, Ebenezer Scrooge, let us see another Christmas. <laughs> you know this place, Ebenezer? Do it! <laughs> Know it? This is the counting house where I was apprenticed. <laughs> Listen. Hello! Choose your partners. <laughs> it's my old master. Bless his heart. My old master alive again. <laughs> and there we are. His clerks, so full of joy on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Advance and retire. Hold hands with your partner. Bow and curtsy. Corkscrew! Thread the needle and back to your places. Look, Scrooge. Look at that carefree young man with the light heart and the gay smile. Do you recognize him, Ebenezer? Y yes, yes. What is the matter, Ebenezer? Nothing. Nothing Something, I think. No, 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 I, I... I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk, Bob Cratchit, right now. That's all. That's all. Hold hands with your partner. Advance and retire. Bow and curtsy. Thread the needle. My time grows short, and we have yet another journey to make. Where now? Come. Again, Scrooge saw himself in a room that was vaguely familiar. He was an older man, a man in the prime of his life. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl. There were tears in her eyes. Matters little, Ebenezer, to you. Very little, I know. Another idol has displaced me. And if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. Belle, listen to me. 
There's nothing the world's so hard on as poverty, and yet nothing it pretends to condemn so much as the pursuit of wealth. The world again? You fear the world too much, Ebenezer. Belle, have I changed towards you? When... when we were engaged, we were both poor. Was it better then? Belle, was it better to be poor? Better, at least, to be happy. You're changed. You were another man then. I was a boy. Do you blame me because I've grown wiser? Have I ever tried to break our engagement? In words? No. Never. In what then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In everything that made my love of any value in your sight. So, I release you from your promise. Belle, Belle, I love you still. Oh, at first it may cause you pain to lose me. A very brief pain. But soon it will be dim, like a half-remembered dream. An unprofitable dream. (laughs) And you'll be glad to be awake from such a dream. May you be happy in the life you have chosen, Ebenezer, for the love of him you once were. Spirit, spirit, it is enough. Show me no more. These were shadows of the things that have been. That they are what they are, do not blame me. No more, no more. One more shadow. Come. The relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in a room, not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. All around them were the voices of children talking and laughing. And before the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like the lass, that Scrooge believed it was the same until he saw her. The girl he had been betrothed to, now a handsome middle-aged woman sitting with her husband at their own fireside. Do you see this man, Ebenezer Scrooge? This man might have been you, and that girl, that girl might have been your daughter, Ebenezer Scrooge. She might have called you father. She might have been a springtime in the haggard winter of your life. Spirit, let me go. Show me no more. Listen now while they speak, Ebenezer. (laughs) Belle, I saw an old friend of yours today. Uh, Who was it? Guess. How can I? Oh, I know. (laughs) Mr. Scrooge. (laughs) <laughs> Mr. Scrooge, it was. I passed his office window. It wasn't shuttered, and there was a candle inside, so I couldn't help seeing him. His partner lies at the point of death, I hear. And there Scrooge sat, all alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, spirit, remove me. Haunt me no more. Leave me, take me back. Take me back. In his anguish, Scrooge began to struggle with the ghost of Christmas past. Lights in the crown of its head burned high and bright. Scrooge, in a last desperate effort, tore the extinguisher cap from its hand and by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. And Scrooge was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness and further of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze, in which his hand relaxed, and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. The stroke of one awakened him and sat him bolt upright in his bed. We pause now for station identification. This is the Prior Lake Players Radio Broadcasting Network. 
You are listening to the Prior Lake Players 2021 presentation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, brought to you by Hulk Machine Company. We now return you to the show. In the stroke of one, Scrooge had awakened suddenly and had sat bolt upright in his bed. He remembered the words of Marley's ghost and wondered from which direction the second specter would appear. He drew aside the curtains and established a sharp lookout all around the bed. At that moment, nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. And, consequently, when no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes. Ten minutes. A quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. And all this time he sat upon the bed, with his nightcap upon his head, the very core and center of a blaze of ruddy light which streamed upon it. Being only light, this was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant. He began to think that the source of this ghostly light might be in an adjoining room, from whence, on further tracing, it seemed to shine. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his own sitting room. There was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove from every part of which a bright gleaming berry stood, And such a mighty blaze went roaring up from the chimney as had never been known in Scrooge's time, or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long beast sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. And in easy state, upon this couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch, in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up high up to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping down the door. <laughs> come in! Come in, Ebenezer Scrooge, and know me better, man! You're... You're... I am the ghost of Christmas present. <laughs> Look upon me! You've never seen the like of me before. <laughs> Spirit. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion and learned the lesson which is working now. If tonight you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. <laughs> Touch my robe, Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> Touch my robe! <laughs> <laughs> The room vanished. So did the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of the night vanished. Sunlight brushed them as they streamed through the clear morning air. The second specter flew at a more leisurely speed, and Scrooge had time to observe people below him shoveling snow on the city roofs, calling out to one another from the parapets, and now and then pelting each other with snowballs. In the streets below them, the polters' shops were still half open, and the fruiters were radiant in their holiday glory. Scrooge and his ghostly guide circled the tall spires as the steeples called good people all to church or chapel. And there below them lay Camden Town, with its squalid streets, ugly crane houses. Of all these dwellings, 
The ghost selected the humblest for their visit. Scrooge, by now past all surprise, recognized Bob Cratchit's wife, dressed in twice turned gown, but brave in ribbons, busily laying the table. Assisting her was Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of the potatoes. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelled a goose and known it to be their own. And now basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onions. And three more young Cratchits danced about the table. Then, once more, the door opened. Quiet, children, quiet. Why, bless your heart alive, Martha, my dear, how late you are. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Mother. How late you are, Martha. Oh, we had a deal of work to finish up last night, and we had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind. As long as you're here now, sit you down before the fire and have a warm, Lord bless you. But where's Father? He's been to church with Tiny Tim. Oh. They'll be along directly. How is Tiny Tim, Mother? Any better at all? Well, sometimes I... I think he is, and sometimes, uh, well, sometimes I think, uh, oh dear God, if anything should happen to Tiny Tim, if Tiny Tim should die. Mother, you mustn't even think of such a thing. Here they come! Merry Christmas, everybody! <laughs> Martha! <laughs> Merry Christmas, Father, and Tim! Merry Christmas, Martha! And there was Bob Cratchit, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes donned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Poor Tiny Tim. He carried a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. And how did little Tim behave in church, Bob? Oh, I like church, Mother. Oh, they sang the nicest hymns. And the people were so kind to me. It was such fun riding home on Daddy's shoulder. He behaved as good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much. And he thinks the strangest things he ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped people saw him in church because he was lame. And it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk in blind men's sea. Oh, Tim, you darling. The girl's mother. Oh, yes, children, all ready. Come, take your places and wait your turn. There's plenty of stuffing and dressing and plum pudding for all of you. Now, Martha, you take care of Tiny Tim. That's right. And see that he eats plenty. He must get strong and well. Now, shall we say grace? Yes, Bob. Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank thee for this daily bread which, in thy mercy, thou dost give to us. Bless us this Christmas day. Keep us all together so that for many years to come we may unite here to do thy will and praise thy name. Amen. 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 And now, my dears, with such a dinner, a toast. A Merry hmm. Christmas to us all, and God bless us. God bless <laughs> us, everyone. And now to Mr. Scrooge. I'll give you a toast to Mr. Scrooge. The founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. Who pays you all a 15 shillings a week. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on. And I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children. Christmas Day. Well, it should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, on which one drinks the elf of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. Oh, you know he is, Bob. Oh, nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day. Well, 
I'll drink his health for your sake. And the days, not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas and an happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I've no doubt. And I say God bless him too, Mother, and everyone. There was nothing of high mark in all of this. They were not a handsome family, these Cratchits. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty and had known, very likely, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased to be with one another, and contented with the time. And when, at last, they faded, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially Tiny Tim, until the last. Spirit, spirit, tell me, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. No, 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 kind spirit. Say he will be spared. Say he will live. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. Many calls Scrooge made that night with the ghost of Christmas present. Now he stood upon a bleak and desert moor where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about as though it were the burial place of giants. Down in the west, the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red which glared upon the desolation for an instant like a sullen eye, then was lost in the thick gloom of the darkest night. A light shone from the window of a hut. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled around a glowing fire. An old, old man and woman with their children and their children's children all decked out gaily in their holiday attire. In this place, Ebenezer Scrooge, the miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth. Still they know me. Do you hear? The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robe, and passing on above the moor, they sped on. Whither? Not to see? To see. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land. Below him were the waves breaking upon a frightful range of rocks. But built upon a dismal reef of sunken stones, some league or so from shore, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base, and storm birds born of wind rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed. Again, the ghost sped on above the dark and heaving sea, on and on, until they lighted on a ship. They stood beside the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the men who had the watch. Dark, ghostly figures in their several stations. Come. Much they saw and far they went, and many places they visited, but always with a happy the spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouses, hospital, and jail, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing. It was a long night were only a night. And it was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. My life upon this globe is very brief, Ebenezer. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight, at midnight. Hark, the hour is come. Not yet. Not yet. There are still more things I wish to learn. 
These you will learn from still another spirit. Still another spirit, Ebenezer. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost. It had vanished. He found himself once more in his bed, in his dressing gown, and his nightcap on his head. He heard the clock strike, and then he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming toward him like a mist along the ground. The spirit slowly, gravely, silently approached. In the very air through which it moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. I am the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Ebenezer Scrooge, I am about to show you the shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Oh, ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. Yet, lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to be. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along. And suddenly they were in a room which Scrooge seemed to remember having seen before, where a woman and a child were. Oh, my son! My little son! I need him. I loved him so. <sighs> Mother dear, you mustn't. It's almost time for Father to be home. Don't let him see you crying. Oh, yes. Yes, Martha. He's light tonight. Oh, he walks slower than he used to. And yet... I've known him to walk very fast indeed, with Tiny Tim on its shoulder. So have I, Mother. Oh, but he was light to carry. And his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble at all. Good evening, my dear. You're late, Bob. I'm sorry, my dear. I went... I went to the churchyard today. I wish you could have gone with me. Would have done your heart good to see how sweet and green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him. I promised Tiny Tim we'd walk there on a Sunday. Oh, Bob. Bob. It's God's will, my dear. Oh, my son. My little son. <laughs> I need him. I loved him so. <laughs> Scrooge tried to break through the shade that held him, to talk with Bob Cratchit, to speak some word of comfort, but the sleeve of the ghost of Christmas yet to come passed in front of him and shut the family from his view. And now they were in an obscure part of town where Scrooge had never been before. The ways were foul and narrow. The shops and houses wretched. The people drunken, slipshod, ugly. The whole quarter reeks of crime and with filth and misery. Deep in this den of infamous resort there was... A low-browed, beetling pawnshop where iron and old rags and bottles were bought. And there was an old charwoman standing at the counter. On doom be bundle, Joe. I hope Scrooge didn't die in nothing catching, eh? Don't be afraid. I ain't so fond of his company I'd take a chance of that. <laughs> Ah, uh, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, and you won't find a hole in it. It's the best he had, and a fine one too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. 
What do you call a wasting of it, Mrs. Dilber? Putting it on him to be buried in. Somebody was fool enough to do it. But I took it off him again. If Calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it ain't good enough for anything. The cat look uglier than he did in that one, the old aura. <laughs> oh, and here's his bed curtains. Small use to have for him where he's going. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truest words you ever spoke, Mrs. Dilber. <sighs> so, this is the end of him, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive. <laughs> to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment like a wing, and withdrawing it revealed another place. A churchyard walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, choked up with too much burying, fat with repleted appetite. A worthy place, the spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Scrooge crept toward it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name. Ebenezer Scrooge. Spirit, spirit, am I? Am I the man who laid dead to pull that bed? The spirit pointed from the grave to him and back again, and the upper portion of its deep black garment was contracted for an instant in its folds, as if it had inclined its head. Ebenezer Scrooge. And then Scrooge saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrank, collapsed, and dwindled, into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. Running to the window, he opened it. He put out his head. No fog, no mist. Clear, bright, jovial, stirring cold, cold piping for the blood to dance to, golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet fresh air, merry bells, oh glorious, glorious. Boy, boy, what's today? Eh, what's that, sir? What day is it, my fine fellow? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. <laughs> Christmas Day? <laughs> Christmas Day? <laughs> then I haven't missed it. The spirits had done it all in one night! All in one night! <laughs> I don't know what to do! <laughs> I'm, I'm as light as a feather! <laughs> I'm as happy as an angel! <laughs> I'm as merry as a schoolboy! <laughs> merry Christmas to everybody! Happy New Year! Happy New Year to all the world! <laughs> Next morning, next morning, Scrooge was early at his office. He went early for a reason. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. Quarter past. No Bob. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. At last... He came. His hat was off before he even opened the door. His comforter, too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Eight and seven are fifteen. Carry the one, twenty-four. Carry the two, thirty-one. And five are thirty-six. Hello, you. Cratchit. Yes, sir. Cratchit. Step this way, if you please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Catch it? What do you mean by coming in at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir. I, I am behind my time. You are? <laughs> yes, I think you are. It's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. It shall not be repeated. I, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. 
And I'll tell you what, my friend, I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. Therefore, <laughs> and therefore, Bob Cratchit, I am about to raise your salary. <laughs> are you are you quite yourself sir no no thank heaven i am not quite myself <laughs> merry christmas bob oh <laughs> <laughs> merry christmas my good fellow a merrier christmas than i have given you for many a year i'll raise your salary and we'll see what we can do for Tiny Tim and the rest of your family. <laughs> Sir, oh. We'll discuss it this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Now, make up the fires. Make them up and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. <laughs> <laughs> and Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. It was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us all, all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the night before the night before Christmas. And all through the Prior Lake Players Prop Shop, not a creature is stirring that doesn't wish you a Merry Christmas. This goes for all of us, for Hauk Machine Company, for myself, for all of us. Bless us, everyone! Thank you for listening to the Prior Lake Players production of A Christmas Carol. Our cast for this year's production is John Stentz as the narrator, Patrick Sheehy as Ebenezer Scrooge, Troy Lowry as Bob Cratchit, Tinka as Mrs. Cratchit, Megan Rowe as Martha Cratchit, Marshall Gillis as Tiny Tim, Joe Weissman as Jacob Marley, Scott Gorman as Ghost of Christmas Past, Patrick McNamer as Ghost of Christmas Present, Luke Langfeld as Ghost of the Future and Belle's Husband, Ariel Johnson as Belle, A.J. Leonardson as Fred, Harry Allgaier as Gentleman, Ben Uke as Mr. Fezziwig, and Annie Estes as Charwoman. The show was directed by Nick Kingdon and Dan Steffens. Our audio engineer was also Dan Steffens. Thank you for joining the Prior Lake Players for this production of A Christmas Carol. If you enjoyed this program, please consider becoming a member or making a tax-deductible donation. Visit us at plplayers.org. That's plplayers.org. Or, if you're listening on YouTube, there will be a QR code for you to scan. Thank you again, and have a Merry Christmas. I'm your announcer, Bob Cummings, and it has been a joy and pleasure to bring this classic Christmas story to your homes. May you find warmth and comfort this holiday season. May your Christmas fires burn brightly with the warm glow of the spirit of the season. Good night, good tidings, and in the words of Tiny Tim, God bless us, everyone. one.